Hi, everybody. I have an interview coming up in just a minute with Annika Lucas, who I'm still rattled by the story and have been ever since I recorded the interview, sold into sex slavery at six years old by her mother. Horrific accounts that you can hear on YouTube. I just don't feel a need to kind of drill her and make her replay all that, especially when we had so many more interesting things to talk about. But, you know, she's a sex slave, six years old. She's taken to a mansion at 10 years old and put into a dungeon room and a dirty mattress and just raped by the highest level people in government. If you think there's anything unreal about her story, dig into it. It's all just real. It's just crazy. Of course, these aren't really the questions that I'm interested in. As you know, my pursuit has been kind of this question of this extended consciousness realm and how that might be influencing what's going on. So here are some clips from this delightful chat. She really is an amazing person. Here are some clips. How do you feel when, when people just deny it? The collective denial is what is creating the evil at the moment. Things have definitely improved. Those people who are lashing out at me are just not looking so good anymore. They're just not looking like the scientists versus me, the crazy one. It doesn't look that way at all. I look like the sound solid person and they seem a little bit crazy. I still have feelings about it. I have feelings about what is happening in Belgium, which is where I'm from. When people found out that there was a network of politicians there that were involved in these extremely dark practices. We went from the whole country being in uproar to eight years later, one man convicted, basically. And the whole country completely silent about it after bodies of children were found. He said when he was caught that he was a small cog in a giant wheel and that he had friends in high places who would protect him. Everything in that case that had anything to do with the existence of this network, having any more prominent people involved, was cut off from the case. There's another kind of evil associated with that. Yes, absolutely. There's degrees to which people are too scared for their own skin, or, you know, for their job or for their life. And that's fair. That's totally fair, understandable. But it's fair, but let's go back to the first part of your conversation. For the deeper kind of growth. For the soul, it would be best that you, that you do whatever it takes. I'm more concerned with people who have little to lose, but whose opinion is just biased because of the brainwashing that comes from those same people in power who are committing these acts. That's a very secular view of things, which is okay as far as it goes. But what about Russ Dizdar? He dabbled in the occult, and now he's spent the last 30 years working with victims of satanic ritual abuse. So a lot of people don't like that satanic ritual abuse thing. Yes, I'm a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. That's what happens in the halls of power. They're Satanists. So, yes, that's what happens. And I also work with people who, like me, have survived this. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and if you've been following along for the last few episodes of Skeptico, you know that my journey into a deeper scientific understanding of consciousness and spirituality has led me to the question of evil, the nature of evil, what we're supposed to do about evil, both personally and collectively. So I want to put that out there because I want to know, I want you to know where I'm coming from. The show today is going to be dark in a lot of ways, heavy, and it's not the direction that I want to go. It's just the direction where this thing has taken me. I know in preparing for this interview, I was swamped with all sorts of emotions 
and I don't even have any direct connection with the experiences of today's guest, Annika Lucas. Um, but then again, you know, maybe that's the real beauty of what Annika is doing with her work at Liberation Prison Yoga and more broadly as an advocate for children that are subjected to the unimaginable horrors of sex crime, sex trafficking, ritual sex abuse, and all that other stuff that we want to pretend doesn't really exist and isn't real. So, Annika, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to Skeptico. Let's talk about yoga. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me on. I guess anyone's journey inward or journey uh, into the nature of reality would lead to the question of evil. And um, I see evil very much in the way that it is described in the yoga uh, scriptures. That is to say, I see evil as ignorance. Ignorance of the self. You know, I, I totally get that. And I've had those kind of conversations before because I, I mentioned just in the few minutes, few seconds we chatted before the interview that I haven't really talked about yoga on this show. And that's true for the most part. I mean, I have 400 shows and most of them are on science and parapsychology and near-death experience and extended consciousness and things like that, that people can kind of approach the question of consciousness from more of a, like I said, kind of more of a guy kind of scientific yeah. standpoint. But the things I deal with is people who want to deny there is this extended consciousness out there, like yogis accept that as a given. I mean, it's part and parcel of what the yoga tradition is. And if you read like autobiography of a yogi, I mean, anyone who's ever read that book within the first first 30 pages, there's shape-shifting animals, teleportation, telepathy, all this stuff is just kind of a given. So I think it, there's a confusion when we talk about evil and it's reduced down to a confusion or, uh, you know, in the Buddhist sense, just kind of a, um, a misunderstanding. I mean, that's kind of like step three. Step one is it does exist. And I guess I, I, I want to kind of circle back to that. I mean, there yes. is evil, right? There, well, there's a lot. Of, let's just say that in our realm, we all have it. We all are ignorant of ourselves, or we wouldn't even have to be here. So it, uh, it's all a matter of degrees, right? Everything is relative in our in our realm, in this realm of duality, everything's relative. What I'm trying to kind of bring this back. It exists and you cannot use yoga or spirituality to bypass the reality of what happens here on earth. And I experienced what I, I think of as some of the darkest experiences having to do with those who have the most power in the world who are literally ruling the world and what is actually going on in those uh, strata of society. Because I think when you're talking about that, you're almost jumping ahead to a fantastic part of the story. Do you want, to, is, hear what, do you want to hear? Do you want yeah. me to, to, to tell your, your audience what happened to me? Not, not right, right yet. Because I think I like to see. It feels so. It feels so yucky that you have to go and you know, bear witness to it in, in that way. But so let me continue with this. We're just having a chat here. Yeah. When when you frame it in that way, I feel like you're jumping to the healing part of the story, which is a magnificent part of your story. Is your healing journey and and the deeper understanding that you've come to uh, regarding the transformation that you went through and the, the horrors that you endured and how you overcame those and were victorious over those. But I guess- And, and the answers that this yielded, this 30-year uh, journey inward, the answers that this yielded as to how to move forward and to 
change the power paradigm to move out of this very dark place that we're in right now. There's my, my two cents are in there too. Yeah. And that's good. It, it keep throwing in your two cents because I can talk a lot and that doesn't always work so well, but I, I wanted to anchor this like with one of the first shows that I did that, that kind of solidified this for me as I interviewed a 20 year FBI guy, his last job was undercover with uh, the man boy love association front fake organization, fake political organization for organized ring of pedophiles, right? So he was indignant because he had entered into this realm that he didn't really even know existed totally. And the, the horrors that he saw as an undercover guy where he had to kind of rub shoulders with these people from the outside, he was stunned. And on the show, you could see his anger and his yeah. frustration. And, yeah. and that's something that, that you know that a lot of people can identify with. But there's also this element that I've encountered on this show of complete denial. That, that yeah, one, I've encountered that too. <laughs> so, so I'm just trying to paint the whole thing here. I, 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 I love the, the, the recovery and the victory, but how do you feel when, when you have to, and that's why I guess I didn't want you to jump in and talk about your story right from the beginning, because mm -hmm. how do you feel when, when people just deny it or, yeah. or don't, don't believe uh, yeah. you oh. or don't believe other people or don't, because they don't believe that this could really be happening at the level that you're talking about. I mean, you get that, right? Absolutely. And I think the, the, the collective denial is what is creating the evil at the moment. I didn't even speak out publicly about my past until I felt ready emotionally to withstand the personal, the inevitable per personal attacks, the disbelief that you know, that, let's just say that when we're speaking of ignorance, that there's just a lot, <laughs> there's a lot out there, not as much as I expected. Or maybe, you know, the time when I started speaking out, just things have definitely improved. Those people who are lashing out at me are just not looking so good anymore. They're just not looking like the scientists versus me, the crazy one. It doesn't look that way at all. I look like the sound solid person and they seem a little bit crazy. I still have feelings about it. I have feelings about what is happening in Belgium, which is where I'm from. When people found out that there was a network of politicians there that were involved in these extremely dark practices, um, through the Dutroux case in 96, we went from the whole country being in uproar and the international press writing about the Belgian pedophile network of VIPs to eight years later, one man convicted, basically. And the whole country completely silent about it after bodies of children were found. And so, yeah, let's just, just review that case for people who, who don't know. I mean, here's a case like for people who are in that denial mode. We, there's photographs, right? There's photographs of cages. There's photographs well, of- Mark Dutroux built dungeons to keep the children in. But he said when he was caught that he was uh, working, that he was a small cog in a giant wheel and that he had friends in high places who would protect him. And then everything in that case that had anything to do with the existence of this network, having any more prominent people involved was cut off from the case. And many people died mysteriously who had any kind of evidence or were ready to testify. So there's material out there, but it's all been suppressed. And people who believe there was more to the story were labeled believers in Belgium and treated as stupid. And it was the intellectuals or anyone who wants to think of themselves as smart that labeled the, the other survivor who spoke up at the time 
as a crazy woman, the myth of maniac and so forth, and sided with the official story. I mean, the smart people ended up siding with the official story and ridiculing anyone who thought there might be more to it. So, you know, I, 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 I'm stumbling here with how to even approach this because there's, there's a million different questions. One, how did that affect you? at the time when that story broke. And I guess the real, that's not really even the question I wanna ask. That's like a fake question that I was gonna ask is, you know, when we talk about the nature of evil, we understand that sometimes we go along with things that we shouldn't go along with. And that's what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. if, if you, uh, just for the protection, you, you could rationalize it for the protection of my family. Well, for the protection of my family, I couldn't expose that person uh, for the protection of myself, for the protection my of my job. life. I my couldn't. I, well, there's an there's another kind of evil associated with that too, and I know you've thought there's deeply the about. That. Yes, absolutely. There's degrees to which people are too scared, simply, but then there is. In the public opinion, I think, which is a larger component. I mean, there's people who know and who don't say anything because they're too scared for their own skin or, you know, for their job or for their life. And that's fair. <laughs> that's totally fair. Understandable. But it's then under, there are, it's understandable, but but is it is it it's fair, but in terms of go, but let's go back to the first part of your conversation for the deeper kind of growth for the for our soul. Uh, can our soul fully grow? If, if no, we... for the soul, it would be best that you that you do whatever it takes. I mean, within reason, of course. You don't just throw your life away, and no one, know, you know, for nothing. But within reason, to do what is right is important, and then you can die free. I think, and then you've. You, 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 you have not committed evil, but what is the right thing? You know, it requires a lot of courage right now to speak up about these things. And of course it's cost a lot of lives. So I'm more concerned with people who have little to lose, but whose opinion is just biased because of the brainwashing that comes from those same people in power who are committing these acts. And I found that the more someone is brainwashed, that's to say the more that you accept the values of the materialistic society, of, of, of our capitalist society, the more you accept the values of the external, the more it actually seems to imply that trauma personal trauma remains covered and so healing from trauma from for each person individually i don't think you can live in this vertical power paradigm without having some trauma at this time so it is for each person to look within and to heal as an act of revolution and of course it is healing healing requires courage just as on a personal level, you have your idea of what your childhood was like, and you have a relationship with your parents, and then you start going within in therapy, and you realize that what you thought your childhood was, is so far from what it actually was, and you change. And it's the same with the world. It measures up. You change, and as you change, and as your consciousness expands, by the neural integration of all the different um, parts that were emotionally stunted during these moments of trauma or unmet emotional needs, all these parts need to find this reflection of their, their innate innocence, their innate purity, going back to the beginning. And through these reflections, we integrate the self and we literally create within our own body-mind system, an, 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 an ego, a more egalitarian structure that makes us then less dependent on the outer values. 
There's a lot that you covered there. And if people, I will play some clips into this show when I air it. And you have a very powerful testimony as to what exactly happened to you. And it's something that has gotten some traction. There's a half a million views of it, which I think is fantastic in one way and that people are able to sit there and watch your horrific testimony of what happened to you and they're able to sit through it and 500,000 people are willing to do that. Awesome. TED Talk you gave, very popular, very revealing and very open on your part. I can play those in and I think that's almost a better way than, than to have you sit and recount what happened to you. So I'm going to switch back to what you just said though in terms of the vertical power paradigm. I, I think there's so much that you're throwing out and it, it, it's, it's wonderful in a way that it kind of requires us to kind of connect the dots of the mind body problem and the neural integration and the, the transformation that we go through. And I understand it from a yogic perspective, kind yeah. of even differently than, than, than maybe other people are taking that. But I want to go back and pick up on a very basic thing you said in this power structure that is responsible for perpetrating these sex crimes against children is also there to influence the message that, it, that gets reflected back. So the reason this stuff doesn't get through to the media, the reason that if you look up the reality of these crimes on Google, the first 20 pages you'll get is about hoaxes, is part of the system. I mean, it is baked into the system to make us do it. I've had interviews with academics who deny the existence of even a consciousness that could contemplate uh, <laughs> this kind of stuff. Absolutely. And especially in academia, unfortunately, because the education, the halls of education really are a perfect brainwashing tool. So I was abused by world leaders at the time in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, as I was a child sex slave. And one of those abusers was someone who influenced politicians. So it was in a way above the politicians and was sort of behind the scenes, not completely, but influencing, you know, had presidents in their pocket, let's put it that way, an American. And also had major newspapers in their pocket, controlling the narrative that goes out. That is the narrative of the media, that is the narrative of Hollywood. And there is so much brainwashing that is spinning a story that makes those in power look like they deserve their positions. When in fact, Everyone knows that that's not accurate. Everyone knows that we vote for someone, one of two people, and then whoever becomes president, we know that they're not going to do what we want them to do. We know that. We know that politicians are corrupt, but we don't want to contemplate that what that actually means, this corruption and the fact that these people are lifting themselves above us and that we are participating by giving away our power by looking up to certain people that are above. even if we're looking down on them we're giving them all this attention we're not taking matters in our own hands we're not making sure that our politicians are doing what we need them to do we are not truly fighting for the peace that we all want well, Annika, I mean, part of the tough part there is to truly accept the reality that you're exposing makes us pretty helpless to put that back in a, in a political framework. It is. I mean, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. Well, I, I think for anyone, it's, it's inconceivable to me to think that uh, politically, I could change the kind of system that has amassed the kind of power that you're exposing. That's just a reality. I mean, I, I'm just pragmatic. I'm, I'm a, yes. I've been successful. I know how to be successful. I know how to accomplish uh, great things materially, but I, I, I don't know how to, I, 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 and from that perspective, I say, no, you, you can't win that game. And I almost 
you know, I like the way you shifted it before. It, it, the only understanding that I can come to it is some kind of uh, spiritual understanding that I need to overcome. And I forget how you put it, but you put it quite brilliantly and beautifully that the, the personal battle of, of trauma, of overcoming, of understanding my deeper spirituality is really the only way to win the larger battle. How did you say it? Yes, sort of like that. I just want to address briefly the uh, word helplessness because I understand that when I speak, it is harder generally, I've noticed, for men who are more brainwashed than women to shoot into action and do something right away to to create the change, you know, to go save the children. It, it's so upsetting to find out uh, that this is the reality and that someone you may have voted for may be a pedophile. That someone you liked and that you were um, fooled and, and that you were wrong. It's hard to admit that. It's hard to assume that anyone who's made it to the top is so compromised that there's no way that they're not involved in something very dark. So to accept it is very difficult and men have a harder time with it, I found that generally than women um, because of the, 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 the privilege. You know, the more privilege you have, the easier it is to avoid looking at you know, dark realities. And that's part of the system. The privilege works as a cushion. Um, and it's also at the expense of those who have less privilege. So those with the least privilege are sort of carrying all the pain that those at the very top of this power paradigm are not feeling at all. So I have to address psychopathy a little bit because it's difficult for most of us to understand what psychopathy is. It's difficult to accept that people that look really good and have a good spiel would actually be raping children. I mean, it's so dark. Most of us can't imagine what getting anywhere near a child like that. We can't imagine it. And so. Well, they it, can't imagine it in your case, a parent who begins sexually molesting their child at the, 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 the youngest of age and then sells them into sex slavery at six years old. That's inconceivable. People can really can't wrap their head around that. But right, right. Exactly. That sickness, that degree of sickness. But right. my mother, I would say, is easier to accept because she's, she's just a sick person that was never found out. But she's a, a regular person. You know, you could find her image in one of those sensational stories, let's say, that we see every day in the news. But when it's someone who is a trusted figure at the top of the power paradigm, that is much harder because we have some kind of relationship with this person because we've seen them on TV or we've, you know, we've listened to their speeches and we've maybe been moved by their words. And to accept that someone like that um, is also engaging in, you know, like my mother only had power over me. So in that she was, you know, at her worst. But those people have power over the entire world. And so if we want to wonder why there is no peace on earth yet, when everybody really wants it, just look at the power structure. And again, it's hard for us to, to imagine that someone can actually be that way. We can't ima you can't imagine that a mother would do that. You can't imagine that someone you might have voted for would do that. But that is what, because we don't really understand. See, we are all about reason. We're all about reason and we like to take things from the physical world and, you know, use evidence and so forth. And we are actually moving in a different era right now where feeling, we, we, we generally as, as a people, we do not understand feeling at all. I've spent 30 years going through my past to reconnect all the reactions and feelings and physical reactions that had to be suppressed from the incident, suppressed because they couldn't be expressed during the incident, the traumatic incident, because I had to survive. 
in reuniting the suppressed feelings and reactions with their original cause or psychological cause. Consciousness expands and it is a, a work of increasing feeling that is one with consciousness. Feeling, increasing your knowledge of feeling, it is a, a science that is not rooted in the physical. And so it's easy in our world to dismiss it because of this horrendous imbalance that we have with you know preponderous focus on reason as um, more valid than feeling but in fact they work together we can't really uh, you know a psychopath is someone who can especially a, a very successful one is someone whose reason works very well but in fact they're completely insane and so this reason and all this intelligence is used to hide the insanity the insanity comes from trauma from very early trauma from not getting a reflection of the self uh, sure maybe uh, i'm sure that that's part of it and i just sometimes wonder that talking about psychopaths which is you know a popular thing to talk about if that doesn't deflect away from the larger part of the consciousness question. So let me tell you a little bit about my journey, as I just told you, you know, in this show, I've been not my personal journey, but so I'm interested in big picture questions. Who are we? Why are we here? So I'm interested in why science insists that we are merely biological robots in a meaningless universe and that this consciousness is an illusion. There is no good or bad there because there is no consciousness, really. It's just we're biological robots. I go, that seems... That, that makes sense. <laughs> that, that, that's absurd. It, it's absurd. You know, it's, it's no one has thought that throughout time. No, 90% of the people on the planet, but that is consistently is the message, the, the paradigm that science operates in. And if people don't accept that, they just have to go look at science. And that's what science says. That's what neuroscience says. That's what psychiatry says. That's what it's built on, right? And you'll find exceptions, people who are on the fringes of that, but that's mostly. So then my next part of my journey was to say, okay, it, there is a reality to consciousness. That's pretty easy to establish scientifically. Is there a reality to extended consciousness? We hear about spirits, demons, angels, God, all this good stuff. Is, that, is there any reality to that? We really have to look no further than the near-death experience science. And now there's over 200 peer-reviewed papers of people who have survived bodily death and have entered some extended realm and we know that they really have survived bodily death and that consciousness as we normally understood it required a brain and these people no longer have that brain function as we understand it and yet they're able to access it again for yogis like you and i it's like of course remember i read autobiography of a yogi and i've been on the mat for 30 years and i've seen the whole thing i know it but if i have to prove it that's where i'd go to point to prove it so the part that kind of concerns me a little bit when we start talking about psychopaths is it's a, a way that potentially that we shut ourselves off from the extended consciousness realm. Now, I just interviewed a guy a couple days ago, Russ Dizdar, and I really enjoyed talking to him. And he's all about satanic ritual abuse. He's a Christian. He's an evangelical. I am not a Christian. And I have a, I don't really understand the evangelical vibe, but yet he's at least in some respects I admire that he's at least engaging with, although in a very narrowly defined way, an understanding of how this extended realm might be working with the realm that is the physical realm. Because we know if we want to go find uh, d despicable, evil people who do horrible things, we can find them in any town. Hold on a moment, because... I speak about psychopaths because the psychopaths that I dealt with were ruling the world and are influencing the entire world. And they were emotionally infantile. So they were extremely smart people, emotionally infantile, who are influencing the entire world. So why, of course, science will be given so much more importance and of course those scientists who hold those narrow views 
will get more screen time. But it's important that we understand psychopathy because those are the people that are influencing us all day long. And I want to, and we are blind, blinded by the reason so that we see someone who seems perfectly reasonable but is emotionally infantile and because we have not done the emotional work on ourselves we have not done the trauma work on ourselves we are not able to see that and this is what i wanted to say is this journey of mine into my own psyche through uh, healing from that childhood trauma it's a spiritual journey there is no way that you can return to a moment trauma is fear of fear of death yes fear fear of losing the physical body and to heal you need to emotionally return to that moment with some faith that this time you'll survive or you can never return so anybody who is one of those psychopathic power addicts has never had courage, has never had the courage to return to any of their personal trauma, however small or it, you know, it may seem, they, run, they will keep running away from it. And that worldview from someone who is traumatized and basically only has the physical world to give themselves some kind of self, sense of self, the more you're attached to external things to define yourself, the more psychopathic you are. If you look at a psychopath, you know, they are the ones who just get rid of the people below them and just climb, climb, climb without any, you know, without any, sense of humanity for the people that they step over or they kill on their way up and brown nosing the people above them and putting down the people below them that's a very secular view of things which is okay as far as it goes but what about russ what about russ Dizdar? he dabbled in the occult and now he spent the last 30 years working with victims of satanic ritual abuse so a lot of people don't like that satanic ritual abuse thing I, I think it's undeniable that there, are, that there are these extended realms that are influencing this realm. And I don't want to go there and pack it into a very narrow uh, biblical definition of it, because I don't think that fits. That doesn't fit with, with, with everything I know. But I don't want to deny it and talk about this in terms of secular psychopathy, people not getting their needs met. It is that it is the way in which each each one of us can make a difference. Yes, I'm a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. That's what happens in the halls of power. They're Satanists. So yes, that's what happens. And I also work with people who, like me, have survived this. That's most of my work now, is working with survivors. And many of them are survivors of satanic But how do we unpack the satanic part of that? For, for you and I, I mean, that's not your, I don't think that's your focus. It's not my focus either, but we have to deal with, with, with some reality there in a way that people can also wrap their heads around that and not just from the secular psychology standpoint. But it, I see it that way because it fits the trauma pattern. It fits someone who has no sense of self who wants power to substitute their self-esteem. Maybe it sounds a little too simplistic, but I was up close and personal with those people. So I see what they do. I was trained, mind control training, to release these powers. And I can probably, could still use them, but the same powers are released if we do the work of integration, of mind-body integration, and that's done through trauma work. It's the, the natural drug, let's say. It's the way, it is spiritual work, but the courage is the key. Without courage, without, see, if someone remains afraid, too afraid, if you remain too afraid, you will be, 
you remain attached to the physical world and you remain attached to um, getting your value from outer things. And we all do that to some degree. So it's for each person to get out in our own personal way to go within and to simply face our own trauma. We don't have to think about Satanism other than perhaps accept that people are engaging in that. But I don't think we're meant so much, you know, so what if you have, you know, lots of people have experiences. I had a near death experience when I was in the network, when I was a child, I went to the other side. I needed it. I needed a miracle. And I, it, it was, it was offered, you know, the universe is completely re recipro reciprocal. And I use the word God. I dare to use the word God, but God is everything. So I don't want to put too much focus on the satanic because it's just part of everything. Most important is I don't want to give that energy any power. I, I think what you're saying is tremendously deep and powerful. And I don't know if people get it or not, but I, I, I get it on so many different levels. One, I get it on a, on a yogic level, you know, I mean, there's so many awesome yoga teachers and I've experienced so many awesome yoga teachers. And I love that you're out there on the mat in prison. And I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about how you show up and how you show up for those, uh, for those incarcerated and how you help them heal. Because I think I understand that. Like I said, I've spent 30 years on the yoga mat that, that, Okay. Me too. I, I just, I get it. You know, yeah. I just, I just get it on a level that I, I, I'd love to talk about the mind body connection and stuff like that. So I'm not always just in my head like this, but I'll tell you the <laughs> other way that I get it. I spoke with just this last year, I spoke with a wonderful woman named Claire Broad and she's a medium in the UK. And we we're talking about all her experiences and her mediumistic experiences and helping people and all that. And I brought up the question with evil because it's been kind of a hot button question with me. And she goes, look, uh, akin to, I think in a way, what you're saying. She goes, look, for 20 years, I've encountered this very, very infrequently. And the reason is because I always look to the light. I always look above. And then I related that back to one of my favorite yoga teachers, Mickey Singer, uh, Untethered Soul. He's just a yogi, really. You know, you can put all these different Oprah Winfrey, New Age stuff, but he's a freaking yogi. And that's what he was from the beginning. And he says, the secret of the ascent is to always look up. And I love that line. I think there's a beauty and a truth to that, that we don't have to dwell in the satanic. We don't have to dwell in the occulted people who want to access power through, you know, you can access power through all these different ways. So these people are accessing it through this extended realm. Who cares, which is kind of what you're saying, because we see people who are doing the same thing, whether they're trying to get ahead in, you know, this way or that way, it's all kind of the same. So I hear what you're saying and I appreciate I just want to put a, a kind of an exclamation point on what you're saying is that to emphasize it too much, to stare into the abyss and to focus on the satanic evil forces that are in play kind of misses the point. Because again, like another great yogi teacher out there, Eckhart Tolle says is that it's normal, insane. You know, what's, what, what we call normal, <laughs> our, our day-to-day -day life is, is rather insane when we really step back and look at it. Completely insane. <laughs> Normal everyday life is completely insane. That's why. So I went into prisons to offer what I received because of my privilege. I had this opportunity to focus on healing. So I went into the prisons and found people who had been through similar, you know, degrees of violence, uh, histories as myself. And and I just wanted to offer what I didn't receive because as a child, no one came to give me hope as even though I was rescued, I, I, I didn't have somebody come and say, you're going to be okay. And, and when I was practicing yoga, I didn't meet the, the teacher that was able to teach me when I, so that I could feel, you know, I always had to overcome the, whether it was the commanding language 
or whether it was the actual kind of, kind of feeling, creepy feelings, unsafe feelings from, you know, the vibration of the teachers. There was so much to overcome in the way that yoga is generally practiced in order to have it work for me as a tool. Because I knew the first time I stepped on the mat, oh, this is it. This is what I need. At the same time, I started practicing meditation with SRF, with Self-Realization Fellowship, Yogananda's organization. And I looked at the meditation practice as the real yoga. And I looked at the yoga practice on the mat as the physical component of the real yoga. And I guess I still do. It's important to be healthy. It's important for energy levels. It's, it's so important for, for physical therapy. It's beautiful. But the way that it's taught is just awful. So I would come into the prisons and, you know, we, we don't use any commands at all. Nothing. First of all, everybody can participate or not. And we keep repeating that, that this is a time for you. This is not my time here. I'm not on a soapbox here. This is time for each one of you to not get yelled at, to not get commanded, because that commanding language is a language of abuse. I was a sex slave, I know. Let, let, let me uh, let me do it with a couple things about yoga, because, oh man, we could we could talk for such a long time. <laughs> One, I am very grateful that I started my yoga practice uh, so many years ago because it's changed so much over the years. And I live out here in Southern California and I just kind of chuckle sometimes when I go into yoga classes and these teachers are trying to grab power and grab control and do all these other things. And, and that's so how you train to teach. It's unfortunate because my yoga teachers even, you know, my first yoga teacher was a very strong male guy who was very into the physical, but there was at the same time just this kind of deeper understanding of the paradox that, that we're immediately in, the mind-body paradox that, that is, and that we're trying to use the physical in this crude way, but we're really accessing something else from the beginning. And so I had so many wonderful uh, female yoga teachers who were all about the metaphor because it's all metaphoric, you know, it's like, and I, I saw a little bit in the videos that you do of your practice. It's all about connecting this physical with the metaphorical counter reality that is the spiritual. And, and as a way of connecting that, I think is wonderful. I think there's so much potential with the mat, but I think there are so many subtleties that you just did a beautiful job of outlining how it can be not fully realized. So I don't know. I just want to emphasize that. And I guess at some point it has to lead into the potential for abuse there again, because we have this power structure that we're setting up. And I don't want to equate it with the kind of abuse that you've endured because we cannot. But there, well, there I, is work a with, um, I work with Me Too victims in the yoga world, particularly also. That's another thing that I do. It happened to me, first of all. And I say that to the degree that we try to teach yoga and fit it in the current power paradigm, the hierarchy, to sell it, you know, it, I'm sorry, it doesn't really work. Well, maybe it never did work. You know, my first teacher was a disciple of BKS Iyengar and, and Iyengar came over to Dallas. He was still alive and I, I did a class with him. He was no shining light of, no. uh, you know, and, and uh, Patabi Joyce is the other he teacher out here where who, I live. He you was know, the one who abused me. He's the one what? Who abused me. So, you know, and, and these are the two primary yeah. uh, uh, vehicles. Exactly. Right. So, so we are blazing. He's a very old man, Patabi Joyce. Yeah. Who was, who was a serial sex offender, by the way. Serial sex offender. I was the first person to write an article about what had happened. And I really had no idea. And now it's turning out he, t thousands of women, thousands of women were assaulted. 
So yeah, no what shiny. Do do with, what do we do with this tradition? What do we, there is no tradition. We are, we are inventing the tradition, right? We are inventing that everyone who shows up on that mat, everyone who is there for the person who starts crying when they do uh, the, the first time they do triangle and their tears are rolling down their face that they don't understand. That is the practice, not these sage on the stage uh, idiots that were, were kind of asked to perform the same kind of cycle of, of power displacement kind of thing. But again, I can point to trauma. The perpetrators in the yoga world who need the power, they need the power to substitute their self-esteem with status if you have no self-esteem. So I know what it's like to go through life without self-esteem. It's very, 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 very difficult. <laughs> and it's very uncomfortable because I really, I, I only started to begin to heal self-esteem in 2013. That was many years after I started therapy. That I was 49. Like beginning of self-esteem, 49 years old. Without self-esteem, life is very uncomfortable. And I see, I didn't have self-esteem, so I'm extremely uncomfortable. The only power that I did get addicted to was the power, the female power of, you know, attracting men, looking good, whatever. That's what I was addicted to. That was the thing. If I didn't have that, I would have just crumbled and, you know, dissolved or something. Other than that, there was always these choices that I could make. Do I choose the power and get to belong to the cool club um, and get to pretend? Or do I choose truth? And so I was too, much too afraid of power because of my experiences. So I would choose truth. And then I would suffer and I would be laughed at or whatever, but not comfortable at all. It's very hard. And it's not as if when I got laughed at that I didn't necessarily think that I made a mistake or something, but I would go to therapy, go to what is underneath that discomfort or what, whatever uh, occurred, whatever emerged. My reactions, my emotions can be traced back to their psychological origin. And once they're connected, once, you know, courage is like a muscle too. I keep bringing it to courage because it's the key to bringing us out of this physical realm that is all about reason and where there's no room for anything else. The courage to face the fear of death, literally, emotionally, but you're sitting in a therapist's office or you're by, you're by yourself or there's someone there that you begin to trust or there's someone that you just look up to and you just expect that they're going to be like a perpetrator, but instead they're, they're kind to you. And so it's confusing and you, you start testing them because now that part that was never seen or heard or understood is just coming to life and you just compulsively are annoying this person and you expect they're going to reject you and then you're going to feel vindicated. You're going to feel that you're not lovable again. And instead they affirm something positive about you and suddenly it hits you that you are not only that you are okay on a deeper level, but that you were always okay. And that what was done to you was actually the other person's stuff. And you've been carrying it around for them. You've been trying to carry it around for them. Yeah, I mean, there's like about a million things that you just touched on there that we could talk about. <laughs> so, but I'm let, talking about courage. Well, here, yeah, let, let, me, let me poke at that a little bit, because that's what I like to do. I like to poke people. All right, good. I like to, I like to be challenged. Good. So, number one, you're going to have to understand that you've given an entirely different <laughs> definition to the meaning of the word privilege, right? So, I love the way that you say you go into prison because you're privileged, because most people do not accept, do, do, would not associate your experience, your life experiences <laughs> with one. I'm right in the United States. Uh, I, yeah, bullshit. That's, don't buy into that and see the, the greater reality that we are all privileged and we're all underprivileged. Just like the whole 
feminine, uh, you know, you're in this suit that you're occupying and you're playing the role of the costume fits and I know the script, so I'll play the part. And you're playing your part, I'm playing my part. But the woman, male, all that kind of stuff gets mixed up too. And then also, I think you also give a new, <laughs> new definition to the meaning of the word rescue, that you were rescued. Rescued, you were on the brink of being the, in the final stage, which is murder, which so many of the people in this situation, children, both men and women face, the final act is an act of murder, and you were on the verge of that. And you were rescued from that? Okay, get I get it. We'll use that term. Well, actually, I, I was in the sense that one of the perpetrators did negotiate to get me out. Yeah. That moment of what would be called weakness in the context of the network, he did pay with his life for that. That, that No kindness goes unpunished in that ah. moment. There we go. The, the other thing, I, I think that the courage thing, I think is, is interesting. And I totally get where you're coming from. I'll tell you, like, one, I, like and I, I rarely ever share this kind of stuff. But like, one of the things I do, I do an ice bath almost every day, you know, and I, I learned it from Wim Hof, who's just a yogi, you know, he does all this breathing and world records. He's just a freaking yogi, just listen to his account. But so here's a guy who's, uh, I think it relates in a way. His story is, his wife has committed suicide. He has three kids. He's completely stunned, traumatized, doesn't know what to do. He's walking along the street and he sees a lake frozen over and he goes, I'm jumping in. I don't want to kill myself, but I'm jumping in. And in that moment of that freezing cold water, he gets a moment of clarity where that yakking voice that's telling us we're not worthy or we're super worthy or whatever, we're privileged or we're a social justice warrior, whatever the fuck it's telling us at the time, that mind stops for him for a minute and he's able to observe. And he says, you know, I don't know what it is, but that's therapy for me and that's where I'm going. And I, I think that, that yoga can be that kind of therapy for people too. I try and bring that to the, to the yoga mat of being, of getting to that place. That, I relate more to the muscle part than the courage part, because to me, getting to that reality that I am merely an observer of this experience is the reality. And I don't think you disagree with that at all, but let's play around since you brought up the term, the, the discipline of yoga, the versus the courage of, of yoga and both, well, I'm not putting down that one word over another, but what about the discipline you have to be disciplined, and, and that helps in this regard. But go ahead, please. <laughs> I think of yoga, obviously, as the whole package to lead you to enlightenment. That is to say, to expand our consciousness to the point where we do not need to come back here to school to learn our lessons, to learn that we are not this physical body, to fully overcome fear of death, to fully overcome our fears, to um, unite with the, the, tr the, the greater, truer, subtler part of our, of our being. That's our, the purpose of yoga, is to find God. And I mean, it's, sometimes God is a charged word, but it, it's to, to find enlightenment, let's say. So that's, that's the purpose of yoga. So, I fit everything that goes into that. So I think primarily meditation, I found that to be a more broad scope practice, let's say. It's helped me on a deeper level. Um, it's helped me make sense of my story. It's helped me see um, my story and my issues in a much larger context that I needed. Otherwise, I would have never been able to so, to get out sanely and the physical practice I, I I do I mean I don't want to and I obviously don't down want to downplay it but it's really mostly for me a physical um, I mean the best physical exercise there there is with because of the breathing and hey let, let's stop and pause for a minute on that and I want you to speak to you have a deep understanding of this stuff, Annika, and 
everything you're sharing is is so meaningful on so many different levels. I hope I can put this interview together in a way that makes sense to people. What is your deeper understanding of that mind body spirit connection as it physically takes place on a yoga mat? Because I think a lot of people, as you were alluding to, they go, they do a studio yoga class or they uh, encounter yoga and they, they get it, but they don't get it on that deeper level. Well, again, yoga is so broad that I think it works on every level. So initially for me, it helped me be inside, have my consciousness be actually in my body. I had no body consciousness because of the abuse. So I was completely dissociated from my body. It brought me back into my body, brought my uh, focus, my consciousness back in my body. You already mentioned a little bit about your work with incarcerated people, people who are in prison and bringing yoga and the unique challenges and opportunities associated with that. What do you think is typically going on that is most misunderstood about mm -hmm. someone who sits down on a yoga mat, maybe for the first time, and experiences something, but doesn't understand what the larger context is. So tell us about that and how that fits in with this non-for-profit business that you have, Liberation Prison Yoga. I think what I find the most beautiful part of the work is not only to help people to relax, to under, help people just through the language, helping people understand, that this is a time to just be, that they don't have to do anything, they don't have to be anyone, that this is a time to just be. And that can be whatever. There is complete freedom in that, to experience a little bit of sense of freedom of this relief of all the pressures, not only from prison life, but all pressures. Each one of our classes, yes, there can be a physical aspect to it, depending, but you know, there's the focus is for me to help people feel completely comfortable on the mat and safe. So knowing that there's nothing that I say that they have to do, and that um, we're going, I'm going to guide a meditation, and this is always speaking to the self as the pure light within the, the consciousness, the pure consciousness beyond the body, beyond circumstances, beyond the physical world, which informs us. And it's just to provide some kind of an opportunity to, 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 to go in and to tap into that source and to feel the nurturing and the sense of safety that comes from that. There's a wonderful grounding part of it, isn't it? Because it is so physical. Annika, thank you so, so much. This has been just a wonderful chat for me. I've really enjoyed it. For people who want to learn more about your work and follow what you're doing and maybe help your cause at uh, Liberation Prison Yoga, but also want to find out more about your help in advocacy and helping for children who are enduring these kind of horrible crimes. Where should they go to learn more? Yes, my, my website is AnnikaLucas.com. Great. Well, we'll definitely have a link to that in the show. And again, thank you so much. You, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're such a wonderful embodiment of that yoga spirit. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to Annika Lucas for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this interview, and it's the question I keep drilling at, and I'm not really, I think, totally connecting with people on this, but I'm going to keep pounding on it, is does evil exist in the extended consciousness realm? So we can listen to Russ Dizdar, awesome guy, and he's saying, hey, these guys are Satanists and they're practicing it, which has these crazy parallels with like Dr. Hugh Urban, Ohio State University. But even when you hear Annika, as beautiful as she is and speaking about this, she's still talking about it from this kind of secular psychological angle, which is a huge part of it, no doubt. But doesn't it make a difference 
that they are actively trying to connect with beings, entities, spirits in the extended consciousness realm and asking those spirits, those entities to help them in these horrible, evil deeds they are committing in this world. Doesn't that matter? It sure as heck seems to matter to me. Love to hear your thoughts on it. As usual, the place to do it is the Skeptical Forum, where you can connect with other people who like to talk about this stuff. Be sure to visit the Skeptical website. You can download all these shows for free, listen to them, no ads or anything like that. Just see if they you think they're as important as I think they are and pass them along to whoever you think needs to hear about this stuff. Thanks so much for joining me. It's so terrific having you along for the ride. And I can't tell you how much I enjoy when I hear people who say, I listened to the show and it got me thinking or it made me mad <laughs> or whatever. I just love the fact that this magical thing happens where I talk into this microphone alone in my little room here and I somehow connect with you. I think that's magic. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.